and welcome to a video which I thought I'd lost over six months ago when I was at the Goodwood Festival of Speed. I've recently discovered a memory card in the bottom of the bag and here we are. So I thought I'd put it up now even though it's over six months old. The other thing I want to apologise for is the fact that I can't interview people. I uh, shouldn't, it's the first time I've done it and I was completely unprepared. I didn't know River Simple were there, uh, I didn't have any equipment charged with me. Basically, the height of professionalism. So yes, it's more the concept of, of what we talk about in the video, the ownership model of the Rasa and uh, the car itself that, I, that that's made me put this video up. Not with the fact that it's an appalling video, quite frankly, but it does raise a few interesting points. The ownership model of the Rasa is the one thing which kind of you know caught me. It's, it's it's different to any other car out there, pretty much. Um, so that's what I think is probably worth a bit of a discussion. Um, tell me what you think about the car itself, as well as the way it, it, that you would end up buying them, and does it appeal to you in any way? That sort of thing. So yes, apologies for the audio and the fact that I can't interview anybody uh, and probably never should again. Um, if I do see anybody at the Festival of Speed this year, which I already have tickets for, so I might see you there, I will be more prepared this time. So yes, let me know what you think about the video. Again, apologise for the crap quality of the audio, etc, etc. And uh, let me know what you think in the comments below. Thank you very much for watching and I'll see you soon. Okay, so this is the River Simple... Uh, Yes, it's called the Raza, uh, as in Tabula Raza, which is Latin for clean slate. So and it's, it's clean slate not just to, for the design of the vehicle, we're putting the vehicle together in a different way to a conventional car, but also a different business model. Yes, that's, that's one thing. Yeah. So let's imagine this is in production, what, how would you get it? What would you buy? No, you would, we, we avoid the term lease or okay. rent, uh, <laughs> because people think they know what that means. Um, we, we call it a performance contract or service contract. Yeah. You take out a contract typically one to three years, very much like taking a mobile phone, and yeah. you pay a monthly direct debit with a fixed price bit yeah. and a mileage rate, just like usage on the phone. Yeah. And, and, uh, and, and that covers all your costs. It is the only transaction you have to go through. Right. We think it's actually a lot less hassle as a way to having got to include insurance, include fuel. So when you fill up with hydrogen, you don't pay, we do. Okay. And, and it's a lot less hassle for the customer. You don't have to haggle with the insurance company every year. You don't have to dispose of it at the end of a three year period or whatever. Um, and, and we aim to bring it to market as an equivalent cost of ownership as a small family hatchback. Um, and that really changes the sort of vehicle we make because we're paying for the running costs so we want to keep the running costs down. It's, it's, it's very difficult to bring low carbon technology to market. It all carries a premium necessarily because it's new and it's low volume. Yeah. And you, to get the cost price down to compete with a conventional car, you need volume. Yeah. But to get the volume, you need the cost price to come down. So it's a real chicken and egg. And in our case, uh, it means that we can bring this car to market at an equivalent price to the customer even though the cost price of the technology is much higher. Yeah. So we think it'll, we can compete with a goal um, yeah. in the marketplace for the customer, even though it'll cost us in volume production about four times as much to make yeah. as it costs VW to make a goal. Right. Yeah, so and, so and really, if you want to get low carbon technologies to market, yeah, yeah, you've yeah. got to get rid of that premium. I mean, you say you've got a leaf, but it, even a leaf is a premium over a conventional car, and uh, let alone a Tesla. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Well, yeah, exactly, I suppose. There's a different way of going about it. I've gone down the prestige route, make it aspirational until it's affordable. Yeah, it's absolutely. It's different routes, I suppose. Yeah. It's a good route, I suppose. Yeah. You know, at least they're trying, I suppose. So, is this Great. how far off you reckon this is from the well, first production car? I mean, is it, is it, can it the, be driven on the road? Yes, it's all road legal. We drive it on the road regularly. Um, and it is an engineering prototype. So, the, 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 the surfaces, for instance, were frozen before they were finished. This is absolutely an engineering prototype. The production car will look very slightly different, but only slightly. The biggest difference will probably be in light packages. The back end is changing a little bit for aerodynamic reasons, but also for styling reasons. And there has been ongoing refinement of the surfaces. So, the last, our uh, Chris Wright, who's, who's styled the car, uh, designer, um, he, he's very keen to point out it is only an engineering prototype and the, 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 it will look subtly different, it will look low recognisably this car. Um, we're building um, a, a run of 20 cars to run the trial next year in Mumbusha, Um and they're all hand built like this, 
and we're calling it a beta test, and we're bringing customers into the development process much earlier than the autumn does generally. And the production car, the biggest single difference will be that it will cost about 30% of what it costs for us to make the batch of 20. Is there a on it yet? We haven't. It's all designed for whole vehicle type approval. We haven't been through any of the tests uh, for whole vehicle uh, approval. Um, but we've done, for instance, an Northwell with another company. Uh, we've done all the crash modelling. We are very clear that we will easily pass the frontal impact test without even having an airbag. We've got much more crushable structure than the conventional car, because we haven't got an engine at the front, which gives you a real advantage in slowing the, uh, uh, decelerating the people much more gently than in a normal car. And we've also got 200 mm of crushable structure on the sides of the car, which, which companies don't normally, cars don't normally have. Side impact is the hardest test for us to pass because the car's light. And you, uh, in the test, you're static on the on, on the ground, and the sled hits you in the side. But it's the same sled whether you're one of our cars or Mercedes. Yeah. Yeah. So, so uh, the side impact, we will have a curtain airbag, side curtain airbag in the car. How do you see the hydrogen availability? Is that based on um, somebody else? That's the mail yeah. available in the UK. Or? Yeah. No, we, we think that uh, we need a transition strategy, and it's the one thing we are very, I mean, really impressed and complimentary about everything the Autos is doing. They're doing brilliant engineering, but they necessarily have to try and put fuel cells in the cars that they already make, and so they're doing a lot of brilliant engineering, solving problems for their own creation. We're trying to sidestep all those problems by building the car in a different way around hydrogen fuel cell technology. The one thing that I think the industry isn't doing is, be, is, is, is facing up to this transition well, I mean, issue. Yeah. And so we are trying to uh, address that by targeting a, a niche that we call the local car. There are a lot of people who take a car for, a lo for local use. But the industry doesn't recognise it, that they don't make a car for that niche. Now we don't mean urban. Uh, in fact, we think it's more likely that it's rural users or people coming in and out of cities. So it's not a smart equipment. And you're more car dependent if you don't live in cities. And, and so if you, if you go for that local market, the great thing is that um, with a normal car, in city capable, long distance uh, conventional car, you need 300 filling stations or so to create a market in the UK. But for a local car, that infrastructure comes down to just one. And you can put in a filling station in somewhere like Oxford, for instance. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Anybody in that area who comes in once a week to Oxford is a potential customer. And it means that if you put 50 cars in, they all use that one filling station. So the filling station is possible too. It's easier to support them all in that area. And it's got a 300 mile range, which is not for 300 mile journeys, but because we want it to, to be at least a week's use of fuel. Right. So, um, so if you're coming in just on Saturday, Saturday mornings for a family shop, for instance, once a week, they will have potential customers. Yeah. And that way, you can you can expect to grow the skeleton of a nationwide network without ever taking a nationwide gamble. Because yeah, 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 each 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 filling station it makes sense on its own. It's commercially viable. And yeah. well, of course, we'll we'll work with and go wherever other hydrogen filling stations appear. We're not going to drive this only ourselves. Yes, there's about a dozen now, and they are opening. Yeah, but... but Yes, absolutely. Yes. Absolutely, yes. Well, the two different models. So this is only 350 bar, and that's 700 bar. So, um, but you can have both models on the same station. If you do a 350 bar filling station, you can't then offer 700. If you've got a 700 bar station, you can offer 350. Uh, but they're different nozzles, so you can't put 700 bar pressure into a 350 bar tank. Yeah, 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 yeah. Boom. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, very quickly, thanks on your visit. Uh, long term prediction is there going to be a, a bigger tower in the future? Yes, absolutely. Oh, absolutely. Have you ever thought about that tower? Well, I think on, on our website we've got a couple of other design concepts we're working on. So, the second vehicle that we've opened into market after this is a light delivery vehicle. Um, it's a huge growth area. Definitely uh, a local delivery van. Yeah. 
sector, I think, is something. Uh, yes. And Amazon and things like this is really driving growth in that, in that segment. And then we've also got a, a five-seater, four-door five-seater on the books as well, um, which we uh, we expect. Oh, we wouldn't bring that, try to bring that to market until there's a really incredible infrastructure. Right? Oh, <laughs> no, no, actually, no, it, 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 it's, well, it's not, it, yes, it's got this sort of, I don't know, what, you, what you call those butterfly doors, I suppose, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, this car is only an 8.5 kilowatt fuel cell, 11 and a half yeah, horsepower, yeah. but it accelerates to 60 in the same, just under 10 seconds, same as the Toyota Mirai, but the Toyota Mirai has over 13 times the power yeah, yeah. to achieve that same acceleration. Admittedly, it's a five-seat car, it's a two-seater, yeah. but our, 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 our four-door car would have an 18 kilowatt fuel cell, which is about a sixth of the power of the, um, of the, of the Mirai. And, um, and, and, and the other thing is, of course, energy efficiency. This, this is about just over three times the yeah, 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 yeah. um, and certainly the half four door car we would expect to be two to two and a half times yeah. the yeah. I was uh, I've read some recently but some have gone down the weight reduction by BMW uh, and then others have gone down the uh, aerodynamic yeah. but, uh, I don't know if this is correct but weight is far less of an issue at speed aerodynamics coming more uh, so absolutely that if this is a local car, presumably it weight is why it's so high. Yes. Is it aerodynamic as well? Uh, it is very, it's just under, we've had it in the wind tunnel, it's just 0.248 is the drag coefficient of the car. Um, so yes, it is very slippery indeed. It's also a very low frontal area. Yeah. So our aerodynamic losses at 60 miles an hour are 4.2 kilowatts. Yeah. Uh, which is really, really tiny. Uh, so our fuel cell of eight and a half kilowatts has got a bit of headroom. And we think that when we come to market, it'll probably be down to about six and a half kilowatts. But it will still have that 0 to 60 time of just under 10 seconds. And, um, uh, but, but you're absolutely right that at constant speed, the weight is much less important. Um, and if you're doing the solar challenge from Darwin down to, to Adelaide, uh, the weight doesn't matter. Really? Yes. Moving yeah. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> <Even> 10 miles. <laughs> a bit squeaky for my time. Yeah. Uh, got it, got it. Three charges. So, yeah, yes. so, yeah, so that, that, that would be. In real world so, use, yeah. um, yeah. uh, weight really is important. Which is why BMW have gone down that route, Nick, presumably. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. With the i3. Yes. Well, it's very, very difficult. So, you look at the effort to be invested that BMW has gone to to get that weight down. They've broken away from metal. Yeah, yeah. And that is very, very difficult to do if you're in, in, the, in the car industry. At the moment. And um, so we absolutely believe we need to do both aerodynamics and weight. Um, and, and, they, and it really has a huge knock on effect on efficiency, on cost, on the capital cost of the components, the number of capacitors, because they, they, they're dictated by the weight of the car, because that's the amount of energy you've got to store. And um, so all these things come rattling down if you, if you focus on weight really seriously. All right, that's it. Thanks for your time. Uh, I'll, I'll leave you to your stand. And, uh, yeah, thanks, Mark. Really no, it's brilliant. Thank you very much, Steve.